What if I told you that in 1999, a sci-fi action movie was released that would redefine cinema for the next few years, be ripe for parody, rip-offs and endless memes, and be so overhyped that it would be easy to forget just how good it actually is. Oh, and that the famous, what if I told you, meme is not based on anything that's spoken in the film itself. The Matrix is everywhere. The Matrix was one of many now iconic movies released in 1999, widely considered one of the strongest years in terms of quality cinema with many modern classics such as Fight Club, The Iron Giant, The Green Mile, The Sixth Sense, Toy Story 2, and the controversial but still acclaimed American Beauty. It also belonged to a very specific trend, where it was one of four sci-fi films released in the same year with a very similar premise of the world is not as it seems. Existence, The 13th Floor, and Dark City, the last of which was also filmed in Australia, and The Matrix used some of their sets. And although Dark City was beloved, critic Roger Ebert's favourite film of 1998, The Matrix won out as the biggest box office success of the four, and with the biggest impact on pop culture and how films were made. So, before we get into why this one has endured for nearly three decades, let's see how it came about. It's not a coincidence that The Matrix popularised a style of fight choreography that was more obviously inspired by the East, because the film's influences can be traced right back to Japanese anime, specifically Ghost in the Shell, a manga first published in 1989, and famously adapted for film in 1995, following a cyborg policewoman in futuristic Japan. I don't believe it. Thermoptic camouflage. The Wachowskis in fact pitched The Matrix to Warner Brothers by showing them Ghost in the Shell and saying, we want to do this for real. Both properties, as well as the other three films released the same year, fall into a subgenre known as cyberpunk, essentially a sci-fi version of the film noirs of the 40s and 50s. These stories examine the effects of advanced technology on human life and society as a whole, usually leaning on the cynical side and showing how those in power abuse said technology for the sake of profit and power. The protagonists of these stories would usually be anti-heroes, often computer hackers or criminals who rebelled against the system, while the villains would usually be corporations and businessmen trying to preserve the status quo. Sound familiar? In fact, the genre had been around for two decades by the time Ghost in the Shell was serialised, and that offered a less pessimistic setting that we now call post-cyberpunk, where society is pretty much the same, but just with cool new gadgets and advanced technology, making life a lot easier. The Matrix, however, leans back towards the former, because that was very much the mentality in the late 90s. You would see this a lot in some of the films released the same year, such as Tyler Durden's famous speech in Fight Club about how the men of the present are frustrated by having no generation defining water fighting like their ancestors and are being driven mad by endless consumerism. Similar is American Beauty, where both Lester and Caroline have an ideal middle-class suburban lifestyle, but are both deeply unhappy despite having everything society told them that they should want. By the end of the 90s, the older members of Gen X were old enough to have entered the workforce after teenage years, dealing with the AIDS epidemic, increased crime, and being told that they would have no futures because the boomers weren't retiring as early as they were expected to. So these films tapped into the existential angst that a lot of people of various ages were feeling at the time. So, how does Neo fit into all of this? Even looking at The Matrix specifically, Neo begins the film as an office drone with a respectable image, also leading a double life as a computer hacker who makes good money on the side. In fact, one of his earlier scenes has him being told that he has a problem with authority. You believe that you are special, that somehow the rules do not apply to you. Then along comes two mysterious people who tell him that he's actually the chosen one, destined to lead people to freedom, and it's even mentioned how unusually old he is to be freed from the Matrix, again tapping into that collective cultural anxiety about being too old to be special. While it's a fairly standard hero's journey, and the Wachowskis said they weren't out to create allegories or anything deeper than simply a really fun action movie, it still reflects the moment so well. Morpheus did what he did because he believed that I'm something I'm not. But while being a time capsule of 1999, it's also pretty evergreen in how timeless Neo's issues can feel. In fact, beginning in the late 2010s, and especially in the last couple of years, feeling exploited or dismissed by uncaring governments has led to the first film being reappraised for how well its values translate to the current age. We marveled at our own magnificence as we gave birth to AI. AI. Neo's arc is shamelessly indulgent and we love it for those reasons. He gets to be told he's special after all and learn to do cool things, as well as saving the day and choosing his own identity, rejecting the name the Matrix gave him and declaring that he's his own person. My name is Neo. Neo is played by Keanu Reeves in one of his career defining roles but one of the first choices was actually Will Smith, who was underwhelmed by the pitch whether Wachowski spent more time talking about the technology for the special effects rather than the story, and he turned it down in favour of Wild Wild West. 
The Wachowskis were actually willing to make the role female if it meant getting the star they needed to get it off the ground, and even offered it to the likes of Michelle Yeoh and Sandra Bullock. The studio pushed for Keanu Reeves, which was lucky for the Wachowskis because he was very into the concept, and even prepared for the role by reading books on, on evolutionary psychology, as well as months of martial arts training to prepare for the fight scenes. And although his career is enjoying a new direction as the star of the John Wick franchise, it's safe to say that Neo will always be a close contender for his most iconic role, and not just him. The Matrix has a very standard action movie formula, where its main protagonists are a trio we often found in 90s and 2000s blockbusters of a male hero, a female love interest, and a number two who's competent enough to be more than just a sidekick, and is usually black or another race to allow the film to feel more modern and integrated. But it's also a film that utilises this formula and its other two leads very well. My name is Trinity. Trinity. The Trinity. Trinity is the love interest, but she's in the unique at the time role where she is already an experienced fighter, having been unplugged from the Matrix for a while and an active character in her own right, with her being involved in the movie's first action scene. It is her that seeks Neo out and brings him into the world, also getting moments where she insists that she's going to join him on his mission to rescue Morpheus, reminding him that she has more field experience. And since I am the ranking officer on this ship, if you don't like it, I believe you can go to hell. The 90s was the girl power era, which you can either thank the Spice Girls for, or just a generation who had grown up after the women's movement of the 60s and the 70s, and it led to some really interesting heroines in the genre films of the day, usually with a moment or two of other characters underestimating them because of their gender, and then proceeding to demonstrate their prowess. I think we can handle one little girl. Trinity's romance with Nia is also central to the story. Since, in the film's famous climax, where Neo is thought dead, she confesses that when she visited the Oracle, she was told that the One would be the man she falls in love with, and admitting that she loves Neo is what confirms to her that he is the One. And then she revives Neo in a unique role reversal of the familiar True Love's Kiss trope from fairy tales. Because I love you. The role was initially offered to notable pop stars of the day, such as Madonna and Janet Jackson, both of whom later regretted turning it down. Sandra Bullock was asked once again when the role of Neo was confirmed to be male, and also declined, and it eventually went to Carrie Ann Moss, who said she had no career beforehand. Due to the physicality required for the role, she had a three hour physical test as part of the casting, and she herself was unsure of whether she'd be able to pull it off for the stunts. In the sequel, she trained for six months to be able to do this scorpion kick, and it was done perfectly on the first take. Moving on to Morpheus. Have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? He's the most prominent character of colour in the film. Although as noted before, people of multiple races were offered the other roles as well. And Morpheus most definitely is not simply a token. He has his own story and motivations, being a freedom fighter who wants to save the world, as well as being allowed to be flawed and fallible in the narrative, with Cypher's defection being motivated by how he resents Morpheus for freeing him and preferring life in the Matrix. He lied to us, Trinity. He tricked us. There was an early idea that the film should have kept in, where it would have been said that Morpheus had been searching for the one for years and gone through five potential candidates already. And while he sacrifices himself for Neo, the white character, the film then flips things around so that Neo refuses to sacrifice Morpheus for the sake of the greater good. And the third act is initially about going back into the Matrix just to rescue him, treating him as someone of great importance in the narrative. You are a father. The characters in the film take turns saving each other further emphasising the idea of an egalitarian future where everyone is of equal value in society's eyes. Superficially, Morpheus also gets to do plenty of cool things. Don't think you are. Know you are. As with Neo and Trinity, multiple name actors turned down the role, including Hong Kong star Chow Yun-Fat and Russell Crowe, with Samuel L. Jackson and Gary Oldman also in consideration. Lawrence Fishburne, however, recalls understanding the script completely and being happy to sign on, although he worried the film would not be made because the idea was too smart. He was then told to base his performance off a character from Neil Gaiman's Sandman comics. You're going to tell me, you're going to die. Agent Smith is also a very effective and memorable villain, with Hugo Weaving's performance being just as iconic of those of the leads, and if it weren't for The Lord of the Rings and V for Vendetta, it would likely be the role he was best known for too. Human beings are a disease. We also have very memorable supporting characters making up Morpheus's crew, who we lament could have appeared in the sequels if the Wachowskis had the hindsight to not kill them off so suddenly, and the one who did survive would have to be dropped from the sequels after a falling out that really needs to be read about to be believed. But back to the positives. The Matrix was also extremely innovative in terms of the fight choreography and stunts it chose to use, 
Again, drawing from Eastern influences. It implemented a technique from Hong Kong cinema known as Wirefu, where Kung Fu would be performed in tandem with wire work, which in this film was there to emphasize the superhuman ability of those in the Matrix. And the advances in special effects technology meant that the green screen and CGI could add even more. All the fights take place in a computer generated world, where the laws of physics could be bent or broken outright. So this stylism made the Matrix stand out so much that multiple other Hollywood films of the early 2000s started replicating the practice, such as Underworld, Kill Bill, and Charlie's Angels. Then there's also the famous bullet dodge sequence in the third act. I've never seen anyone move that fast. Waifu and Bullet Time are a bit of an acquired taste, since it is very stylized and can make or break the film for some but I personally love it. The fight choreography is amazingly unique and it contributes to why I still love this film today. After all, it was copied so much because it was legitimately a fantastic aspect of the whole presentation. And you know what they say about imitation. The Matrix is now 25 years old, making it the same age as me, sheesh. And while when it got to 10, people were starting to say it didn't age well and probably wouldn't have much staying power. It's safe to say that time has proven them wrong. It holds up enough that they tested the water with a four film in 2021 titled The Matrix Resurrections. No doubt influenced both by good old nostalgia and Keanu Reeves coming back into prominence thanks to the John Wick films. Literally having his hair long in this because he was shooting John Wick 4 at the same time. While not a great success at the box office, that was likely more due to the pandemic and the decision to release it on streaming for 30 days as well. And there are reportedly plans for another one, even though it was an attempt to end the franchise for good. Guess you can't keep a good near down. Or maybe because the themes and topics the first one dealt with are still relevant today and people are in desperate need of something that not only makes them feel good, but gives them the slim hope that one day they too can stand up and make a difference. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like, subscribe and comment your thoughts on the Matrix down below. Thank you for watching.